here. Let's do this. Let's read 2 Kings chapter 13, page number 438. If you're there, would you say amen? All right, read with me if you will, or let me read to you verse 20 and verse number 21. And then if you will, just leave your Bibles open. The Bible said in verse number 20 of 2 Kings 13, And Elijah died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man that, behold, they spied a band of men. And they cast the man, that is the man that they were burying, they cast him into the sepulcher of Elijah. And when the man was let down, so they just threw this old boy in there. And when they let him down and he touched the bones of Elijah, he revived and stood up on his feet. What a story. You ain't never seen nothing like that happen, and neither have I. So if you'll leave your Bibles open for just a little bit, I want to preach about this thought. I'll just take a thought from this and preach a little bit about it tonight. Let's pray. Father, bless your word and help us tonight. From these verses, may our hearts be encouraged. May we be helped and blessed tonight from this text and the one little thought that I'd like to lift out of it and just preach about it. God, please use it to help us and encourage us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, over the last several weeks in our Sunday evening services, we've been following the prophet of God named Elijah around as he ministered in the land of Israel during the days of great apostasy and spiritual decline. Elijah has become God's voice and has become God's vessels, uh, uh, vessel since God, for reasons unknown to you and I, God removed Elijah from off the face of the earth. Elijah was the prophet of God who confronted the worship of Baal on top of Mount Carmel. And through him, God wrought a great victory, and the hearts and the lives of God's people were, re were revived when the fire of God fell in one of the most memorable moments in all of the Word of God. But for reasons unknown to us, and God doesn't have to explain the way he works to you and to me, we're just simply told in the Bible that the judge of the earth always does right. And though I may not understand how all that's going to come out in the end, I know one thing. God doesn't have to explain his actions or what happens uh, to me. He, he owes me no explanation. And God, for some reason, has, has removed Elijah from off the earth. And God has in turn placed the mantle of leadership, spiritual leadership in a nation, upon Elisha. And Elijah then begins to travel the breadth of the land of Israel, confronting the coldness and the indifference in the hearts and the lives of God's people. Elijah has been called by many the prophet of miracles, and he certainly lived up to that name. There's really no way to number all the miracles that God did through the prophet Elijah because really there's miracles within the miracles. But some of the more notable miracles that, that he performed through Elijah and we've looked at is, what about the woman who was at the point of destitution? And uh, uh, the, the creditors had come to take her sons away, and her husband had died. And uh, she had that little pot of oil. And, and Elijah, the man of God, said, go borrow a vessel. Go borrow vessels, not a few. And she began to pour that oil out, and that oil did not cease until the vessels run out. And she took that, that money, uh, sold that oil and took that money and paid off the debts and lived on the rest. What a miracle that was. And then what a about the miracle there of that man and woman who built that chamber on the side of their house, the great woman of Shunem. And for some biological reason, they were unable to have a child. And the prophet, the man of God, found out about that, and he just spoke the word to her. And nine months later, according to the time of life, a little baby was born to an old man and an old woman. And then what about after that baby had grown up and it died on a day and evidently had some kind of a stroke and, it, and, and, and the, the little child passed away or the young man passed away and Elijah went to where he was and, and, and revived him and, and life came back into his dead body after his sudden death. What a miracle that was. What about the healing of old Naaman, the, the Syrian commander in chief of the army and, and how that he had leprosy and Elijah the man of God said, hey, go down to the river Jordan and dip seven times in the Jordan River and your flesh shall be made whole and when he did it after some reluctance, what about the healing 
healing of old Naaman in the waters, the murky, muddy waters of the Jordan River. And then what about the relocating and the recovery of the axe head that flew off into the water? And we preached about that a few weeks ago. And that old axe head, as that old boy was just chopping away, and the axe head came off and flew in the water. And then the Bible just nonchalantly says, after Elijah cut a branch off a tree and cast it into the water, he didn't stir around, he just threw it in there. And then nonchalantly, the Bible said, and the iron did swim. What a miracle that was. And then last week, what about that miracle as he led all that Syrian army into downtown, uh, uh, downtown uh, Samaria and uh, God had smote them all with blindness at the, at the prophecy of the word of the, of the man of God. And the whole army, perhaps hundreds of thousands of soldiers, were led right downtown Samaria. And what a miracle that was. And now in our text, we're, said, we're simply told that Elisha, the man of God, has died. And right after his death, or shortly thereafter, he performs one final miracle. I mean, even though he's dead, he had one left in him. Even though he had been buried after his death, he performed one final miracle. According to verse number 20, Elisha's now died. He, unlike his predecessor Elijah, who was carried off the earth without death, one of only two men in our Bible who left the earth without seeing death, Elijah and Enoch, Elijah has now died. I don't know how old he is. We have no idea to understand how old he is. We're simply told that he died. I don't know if he died from a stroke. I don't know if he had a heart attack. Maybe he died just the result of old age. We have no idea, but we're simply told that he died. He was buried in the sepulcher, and evidently he's been dead now for some time. And the reason I say that is because the Bible said that this old boy that had died was cast, and when his dead carcass came into the bones, the contact with the bones of the man of God, so evidently decomposition has set in, and the flesh is now gone off the bones of the body of the prophet Elijah. Nothing left but his skeletal remains. And when this old boy is thrown into that, uh, thrown into that sepulcher, when his body comes into the contact with the bones of Elijah, he was revived and he came back to life again. It's really an amazing fact how that happened. And we're told there in verse number 20 that the Moabites had invaded the land at the coming end of the new, of the new year. Uh, uh, unlike our new New year that comes in in January, the Jewish New Year begins in the month of April. And the month of April is always the time of like the winter harvest, like the crops that are planting in the winter, like the barley harvest and the, maybe perhaps the wheat harvest or whatever is planted and it grows in the winter season. And then in the month of April, the beginning of the brand new year, that crop, those crops begins to be harvested. Well, these Moabites would invade the land of Israel at the beginning of every year and they would take off carry off some of the crops, some of the harvest that the people of God had worked on throughout the summer. Well, we're told in our text that these Moabites have invaded the land. Uh, there's this band of men, maybe, can I call them pallbearers, and they're carrying the carcass of maybe a friend, and they're carrying it to be buried. When some of these marauding Moabite gangs enter the land, and when these pallbearers see these, these Moabites that have come into the land in an attempt to get away from them, they just simply take the, the man that they're carrying, the carcass that they're carrying, and they just discard it into the sepulcher of Elijah. They're in a hurry to get away, and they throw him in there, and the Bible said that when the body of that man touched the bones of Elijah, buddy, I'm telling you, life springs back in to the body of the one who had been deceased. Can you just imagine how surprised those pallbearers were when the man that they had just buried came up running alongside of them? and trying to get away from those Moabite thugs. I mean, can you just not understand how all that, that Elijah had been buried, but even though he was buried, he was not dead. I was reading this week, I've been reading, and I don't know what even set me on it, but I was just reading this week about some things that had been happening in different parts of the world. Um, uh, from, from things that had been buried from many years ago. For instance, here's an article, and I think this is, a, this is one. Here's, a, here's an article from the, uh, from the country of Germany where a World War II bomb 
that uh, was detonated, exploded, and it actually killed a, a, a man that was operating this heavy machinery who was digging down in the earth. They were building, a, a, of all things, a Tesla factory over there. And uh, they were digging down. They were building this factory over there. And this old boy, unbeknownst, he's sitting in a digger and he's moving dirt. He's trying to dig down for a foundation. And he accidentally comes upon, he didn't know it, a, a bomb that had been there since World War II. Evidently been dropped by the Allies in the country of Germany during World War II and through the process of the years it had been covered over by the dirt and when he hit that thing with the, the front end loader of his digger that bomb exploded and it killed that old boy and the article said people are still dying from World War II bombs. It had been buried but it was not dead. Then I got another article that says that World War II unexploded bombs are still killing people. And this one actually took place over in England again. And let's see if I can read you a little bit about this. It said back in April of 2014, a World War II bomb exploded killing seven people in Bangkok. And the tragedy in that case was it was dug up again by a construction worker. And uh, he didn't even know it. He picked it up. He just put it in the back of a dump truck. They carried it off to a scrapyard. And while they were there, that crazy bomb went off and killed seven people. And it says this in the article, unexploded bombs are found uh, with, uh, with disturbing regularity in Germany, even though decades now later, 75, 80 years after the end of World War II, they're still finding bombs and those bombs still have the ability to go off and to take people's lives. There's another article about something that was buried and yet it was not dead. This article's from the Solomon Islands. I, if you're familiar with World War II, you'll know that was a, a very hot spot back in those days, the Solomon Islands. And this was in May of this year, this article, and it said this, a man has been killed and three people injured after a World War II shell detonated in the Solomon Islands. And by the way, that's not a lone incident because the, the article went on to say that in the last six months, three people have been killed by exploding bombs that were placed there or dropped there in World War II. And the article went on to say that the uh, one of the leaders of the country is saying and calling on the U.S. saying, you created that mess. Y'all need to come over here and clean this mess up. I think they ought to stop for just a moment and instead of telling us to get over there and clean the mess up, they ought to thank God they still got some freedom because America went over there and liberated, the, liberated them from Japan tyranny and domination back in World War II and cleaned the old bomb, their own bombs up over there. Amen. But I said that to say this. People are still being killed by bombs that have been buried. So tonight, for just a few minutes, could I preach on this thought right here? I want to preach on just because it's buried don't mean that it's dead. Just because that it's buried doesn't mean that it's dead. Here's Elijah. He's been buried, but I tell you, evidently there was still some power flowing through them bones. There was, still, there was still some of God's anointing upon that dear man of God. And though he had been dead perhaps for years for the decomposition, eat the flesh off his body, I'm telling you the power of God was still there. Even though he had been buried, it was still alive. Just because something's been buried don't mean that it's dead. Let me tell you in three areas where that's true tonight. Help me, if you will, for just a minute. First of all, I'll put this down. That's true. That statement is true when it comes to the Word of God. That statement is true. I mean, just because the Word of God gets buried don't mean that it's dead. Now, the reason I say that is because just a few chapters over in the book of 2 Kings, we come across the story of a king by the name of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good man. His wife, Hezebah, they were good people. Oh, Hezekiah perhaps led in one of the, if not the, uh, one of the greatest revivals in all the Old Testament. Boy, what a good king oh Hezekiah was. He was the one who, when he became king, Israel had got that brazen serpent. Remember the story uh, when Israel was traveling through the wilderness and, and they started complaining and the fiery serpents went among them and Moses cried out to God because thousands of people were dying from the bites of these fiery serpents and God said hey get a brazen serpent put it on a pole hold it up run through the camp tell everybody to look at the serpent on the pole and if they'll look they'll live remember the story in the Old Testament well let me tell you something in the days of Hezekiah they'd kept that brazen serpent and they would started worshiping that crazy thing I mean they would made a God out of that they named it Nehushtan 
And they begin to worship that, that, that God. They called it Nehushtan. And they were worshiping that thing when Hezekiah became king. And one of the first things that he did is he got a hold of that and destroyed it and said, okay, from here on out, we're not worshiping a snake God. We're going to worship the living and the true God. And he pointed the nation back toward God. Hezekiah and his wife Hephzibah were a good couple. They loved the Lord and they led the nation in revival. Well, let me tell you something about Hezekiah. He died at the tender age of only 54 years old. He would have died at 39, but he started crying out and praying to God. And God gave him a 15-year extension to his life. And he died at the ripe old age of 54 years old. Well, he and Hephzibah had a boy by the name of Manasseh. Now, I want to tell you everything that Hezekiah was, Manasseh was not. You talk about a wicked old boy. Oh, old Manasseh was a wicked, wicked boy. I'm telling you, the Bible said, well, let me read it to you. The Bible said this about Manasseh. Manasseh seduced them. Talking about the people of God. He seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. In other words, the Bible said that Manasseh led the people of God to do worse, more so than the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Termites and the Jebusites and the rest of that crowd. He did more to cause the people to sin than all that other crowd did that God had destroyed before them. And let me tell you something. Manasseh would reign for 55 years. I want to tell you something. You search me out on this. But out of the 19 kings that the northern kingdom had and out of the 19 kings that the southern kingdom had, the longest reigning king out of all of them was this wicked boy by the name of Manasseh. Does that not speak to us, to us something about the long suffering of our God? Does that not speak to us a little bit about the patience of our God? Hey, aren't you glad with the way that you are and the way that I am so up and so down and so in and so out and so off and so on and so hot and so cold? Aren't you glad we got a patient God? Hey, aren't you glad we got a long suffering God? Aren't you glad that we got a God that will get easily ticked off and move in wrath against us? Just like old Manasseh, 55 years he reigned as a king in the name and God patiently waited. Let me tell you something about old Manasseh. He shut up the house of God. He had no use for the house of God whatsoever. Can I say this? He desecrated the house of God. Let me put it in precise kind of language. He trashed, he trashed the house of God. And for all those years that he sat upon the throne, the house of God sat over there in a great state of disrepair. It was a great reproach for the people of God, for the house of God to sit over there in a state like it was. And he had just trashed it. He shut up the doors. He nailed the doors shut. Wouldn't let anybody go in. I mean, man, he totally cut the people of God off from the house of God. Now, you could just imagine for 55, 54 years, uh, 55 years that this went on, how the, uh, the house of God begin to deteriorate and things begin to break down and things begin to happen to the house of God. But the Bible said that eventually old Manasseh dies and his boy by the name of Josiah at the tender age of only eight years old becomes the king of Judah. Old Josiah, I call him the boy king and the Bible said that one of the first things that Josiah does is he opens back up the house of God. Can I just stop and say this real fast? You can't blame your mom mom and daddy for not serving God. No, sir. There's a lot of people in our day that want to use an excuse. Well, I didn't have a mom and daddy serve God, so don't expect me to serve God. Here's Josiah. He had a daddy that was wicked as you know what, and yet old Josiah at the tender age of eight years old made up his mind to do that which is right in the sight of God. When are we going to stop making excuses for our heritage, our pedigree, and blame it on this and blame it on that? I can't serve God because of my wife. I can't serve God because of my mom and my daddy. I can't serve God because of my children and just bear the brunt of it ourselves and say it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. Help me, oh God, to serve you in these days. Josiah opened back up the house of God and as you can just imagine, oh, the trash and the rubble and all that had happened there in the house of God. But one of the first things that happened when they went back into the house of God, the Bible said the first thing, one of the first things is they found a copy of the law of God. Let me say it like this. They found a copy 
of the Word of God. And the Bible said Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. For 55 years, they, they, the Bible had been buried. For 55 years, the Bible had been over in the house of God and laying on to underneath a bunch of rubbish and a bunch of trash. But just because it was buried did not mean that it was dead. Why, the Bible said they got that book of the law out and they started reading the Word of God and it wasn't long till the people of God started repenting and crying out to God for mercy. They understood they were under the judgment and the wrath of God. And ladies and gentlemen, revival broke out in the land 55 years after the Bible had been buried. It still had the power to bring about a revival in the land of Judah. Boy, I want to say in America, I get it. I'm like you. We're doing our best to do away with the Word of God. We're doing our best to bury the Word of God. Even in a lot of churches today, the the Word of God is buried. They're more about drama and dialogue and rap and contemporary services. The pulpit is on wheels so they can roll it in and out. But I'm telling you, not much attention anymore is given to the Word of God. But I'll tell you, bless your heart, you can bury it if you want to. But just because it's buried don't mean it's dead. It's still got the power that it's always had. It'll still change lives. It'll still revive churches. It'll still save a nation. Thank God for the Bible. Hey, the Word of God may be buried, but bless your heart, it ain't dead. Here in America, listen, I understand it's buried beneath our skepticism. It's buried beneath our liberalism. It's buried beneath our socialism. It's buried beneath our atheism. It's buried beneath our materialism. But bless your heart, just because you try to bury it don't mean it is dead. I'm telling you, it's alive. It's sharper and powerful and more powerful than any two-edged sword. What we don't need to do in the Bible uh, in America is to rewrite the Bible or to revise the Bible. And we don't need to reinterpret the Bible. And we don't need to reinterpret invent the Bible and we don't need to rebut or reduce or refine or reform or refute or remove or replace the Bible. No sir in America what we need to do is to revisit the Bible and to reread the Bible and to regard the Bible and to respect the Bible and to recite the Bible and to receive the Bible and to remember the Bible and to report the Bible and to release the Bible and bless your heart revive the Bible because just because it's buried don't mean that it's dead. Boy, I'll tell you, I've heard a lot of testimonies in my time. I've been in church since I was born into this world. I've been in services where people have stood up and testified. But you know, there's some testimonies that I've never heard before. I've never heard anybody stand up and say, you know, I used to be bad to lie. But uh, one day I, got a, I went to the library and, and, I, and I got a book on mathematics. And I read about where one plus one was two. And it's always going to be one plus one is two. And ever since I discovered that truth, all I've been able to do is tell the truth myself. I've never heard a testimony like that in my life. I've never heard anybody say, I used to be bad to drink, but I went to the library one day and checked out a chemistry book, and I started reading about the components of alcohol. And when I started reading about what all goes into alcohol and what it can do to the body and how it breaks down in the body, and I read that book of chemistry, I quit drinking. I no longer have anything to do with drink because I read a book of chemistry. Never heard that one before. I've never heard this testimony before. I used to be a prostitute. I used to be immoral. But one day I went and checked out a book at the library on the subject of violence and I got to reading about the human body and I got to reading about all these diseases and all that stuff and I'm telling you by the time I got through with that book of biology I went out of the immoral business I've never heard a testimony like that but bless your heart here's what I have heard I've heard people say before I used to be bad to lie and it used to be bad to drink and it used to be bad to be immoral but I went to church somewhere and some old preacher wasn't highly educated but he took an old King James Bible and he stood behind the pulpit and he began to preach the word of God and something got a hold of me. I got under conviction and I got saved by the grace of God. I'm here to tell you, you can bury it, but just because it's buried don't mean that it's dead. Amen. I'm glad we got a church that still believes in the Bible. I'm glad we got a church that still preaches the Bible. I know, I know the Bible has power. I get all that. I, listen, when I preach the Bible and people don't get saved, it ain't the Bible's fault. Can I have an amen? I'll tell you who's, it might be my fault. 
It could be that I'm so back sitting out of the will of God, I don't even know where God's at. It could be your fault. But I tell you, bless your heart, it ain't that book's fault. It's still the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Thank God the Bible is still quicker and powerful and more sharper than a two-edged sword. I'm telling you, the Bible is still real. It's still a word of God, and it'll still get the job done. Even though it's buried, don't mean that it's dead. That's true when it comes to the Word of God. Number two, that's true when it comes to the Son of God. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got to thinking about the Son of God and how we're all well aware of what happened to Jesus, how that He came into the world to reveal the Father unto us, how that He came into this world to make known unto us God the Father, how that He came into this world to show us the love of God. And yet we read in our New Testament how that we treated, or may I, maybe I should say how we mistreated the Son of God, how He was persecuted and mocked, and how He was ridiculed. They said He was born of fornication. They said He was nothing more than a liar. They said that He was full of the devil. They said that he was a blasphemer. They said that he was a lunatic. And if all that wasn't bad enough, finally they gave their voice and they gave their consent to put the Son of God to death. They all cried out to crucify him. They led him away after a beating that would have killed most, many, uh, most any other man. They led him out to Old Skull Hill, a place called Golgotha, a place called Calvary. And there they crucified him. They nailed him to a cross and sitting down, they watched him there. And for six straight hours, the Son of God hung upon the cross of Calvary, hung upon that cross. The flies and the insects eating away at his flesh. The sun sucking every bit of the moisture from his body, his life's blood seeping slowly from his body. The pain and the torture was unbearable. The muscle cramps, the dehydration, the heat, the distress, all of that setting in on the Son of God. And if all that wasn't bad enough, then the unthinkable happened. God sitting on the throne that y'all just sang about just a moment ago in heaven turned his own back upon his own Son while Jesus was hanging on that cross because our sin, taking our sin upon him. God turned away. God abandoned his own son on the cross of Calvary. And then at that three o'clock hour, just as the light began to shine once again, the life of the Lord Jesus left his body and he died. Joseph and Nicodemus went to uh, Pilate and begged, can we have his body? We'd like to bury him. And Pilate gave consent to Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus to bury the Son of God. The disciples went into mourning and isolation out of fear as they thought the same thing that happened to him would happen to them. On that first day, they were mourning and they were weeping about the death of the Son of God. That second day, all hope was lost that they would ever see Jesus and they would ever be able to show their face once again. But on the morning of the third day, some ladies went out to the tomb early that morning with some anointing oil, some spices, and some fragrances to put upon the body of the Son of God and they found out that even though he had been buried Amen they found out even though he had been buried that he still wasn't dead when they walked out to that tomb that morning, they found the one that they thought was dead. They found him to be alive. He was alive and alive forevermore. He stayed on this earth for 40 more days, showing himself to be alive by any many infallible proofs. And then I don't know why y'all saying this tonight, but maybe I've got a little inkling now. The Bible said on that 40th day, he went out to the Mount of Olives. He bid farewell to his disciples. And the Bible said he left. He called a cloud and he went back to heaven but bless your heart we haven't seen the last of him yet he's coming back one of these days and we're going to see him just as they saw him when he comes back again I'm here to tell you he may have been buried they may have said we've seen the last of him but just because he was buried didn't mean that he was dead head men hey we got a living savior tonight I know Joe Biden's in the White House, but Jesus is on the throne. Hey, I know, I know, I know uh, Nancy Pelosi may be our next vice president, but Jesus is still alive. Hey, 
Amen. Hey, I don't care what happens in this world. I'm glad I can tell you they may have buried him, but he wasn't dead. 72 hours later, he walked out of that tomb and said, I am he that was dead, and behold, I'm alive and alive forevermore. That's my Savior this evening. Even though he was buried, he wasn't dead. And can I just close with this one? It's true when it comes to the people of God. We may bury them, but that don't mean they're dead. <laughs> Boy, death's piled in on us recently in our church. I went back over my list recently. You know, this is my 25th year, and on average, here at Woodland for 25 years, I've averaged about 30 funerals every year. Some of them, some years, there's been some years, there's been a little more. I remember a year or so ago, it seemed like I was going to have one funeral per week. I finally wound up about 45 that year. Most of the time, it's about 30 a year. I've been running behind all this year. I think I'm about up to number 12 now. And I know you probably say, Preacher, that sounds a little bit cold that you count it like it's a statistic. Well, can I tell you something? When you deal with it as much as I have to deal with it, you don't understand the emotional distress of all that until you're going through it yourself. So don't get a little bit callous toward me because I seem a little bit callous toward it because I'm not. But sometimes you just have to have something to kind of keep yourself going a little bit. I've been to the funeral home so many times with our precious members from our church, been to the graveyards. Boy, we buried a lot of precious people in our church in recent years. I won't even begin to mention some of the names because I'll hurt somebody's feelings and not even intend to. But you stop and think about that. 25 years, close to a 1,000 funerals. But the one thing that I've never seen is when we walk out to the graveyard and uh, I finally say that word of prayer and walk around, shake everybody's hand, and we get up. They, the funeral director steps up and says, this concludes the service now. The family's going to step out from underneath the tent or whatever the director may say. Can I tell you something? Their bodies are lowered into the earth. and It won't be long until they'll come out and they'll start taking that dirt that they got piled up. They don't want us to see that dirt most of the time. They'll take that dirt and they'll set it off somewhere because they don't want the family to see that dirt there. In fact, uh, the thing that I've noticed about funerals is they take that green indoor-outdoor carpet, if you've ever noticed that, and they lay it around the opening of that grave because they don't want us to see the dirt or the grave itself, and they'll set that thing on top of the grave, and, and uh, you know, the pallbearers will come in and bring, it up, bring the ca casket up and set it on top of the grave, and they try to make it as, uh, as appealing as, as possible. They try to soften the blow of death. So they cover up the dirt. They'll take it over there. and they won't, they won't bring the dirt back till the family is gone. or They won't pull the green carpet away while the next time the family comes out, they've then got everything took care of. They put all the flowers and laid them out on top of that grave and just made it look as pretty and as, and, uh, as, as pleasing as possible. You know, in all the funerals that I've had, I've never seen a one of them get up and walk away. In all the funerals that I've ever preached in my life, I've never seen anybody get up and walk away. There's something about death that just seems so final. There's just something about it when they close that lid for the last time and uh, we know that's it. There's something about the director saying to the family, okay, it's time to go, and you know that's it. You now give up all control over the body of your loved one. It's out of your hands. They'll be buried. You won't see them again. But remember the title of my message is, just because they're buried don't mean that they're dead. Because can I tell you something about our precious loved ones tonight? They are more alive tonight if they were saved. And by the way, if they were unsaved. But if they're saved, they're more alive tonight than they've ever been in their whole life. 
And the Bible reminds us they're absent from us, but they are present with the Lord. And just because we have to throw dirt, and just because we lay flowers, and just because we turn our back and walk away, and just because they're buried, don't mean that they're dead. In fact, there's going to come a day when we're going to see them again. When I was growing up, one of my favorite programs when I was growing up was Tarzan. And you may remember Tarzan and Jane and, and uh, boy, boy, Tarzan and Jane and boy. I don't know why they never gave that boy a name. I guess his name was Boy. But you remember every time that Tar Tarzan would get in distress... When, when uh, the enemy was closing in on him and the poachers were trying to kill him or maybe the savages were on his trail and it looked like it was curtains for Tarzan, he would let out one of them war hoops. Oh! And every animal in the jungle would come running to his rescue. And it wasn't long till the situation of Tarzan was reversed and everything was all right. I just want to tell you that our Savior is going to come back from heaven one of these days. I don't know exactly what he's going to say, but it's probably going to be something in the Greek like this. Oh! And every buried child of God, those that we throwed the dirt on top of and we buried... Those that have been in his presence during that time are going to come back with him. He's going to call their body up out of the grave. And there's going to be a reuniting of body and soul. And the word of God reminds us that just because they've been buried don't mean that they're dead. We're going to rise up to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's going to be a good day, friend. That's going to be a good day. So until then... Yeah, my, my, my loved ones are gone. But I ain't going to quit serving God. I don't know why things happen in my family the way that they happened. But I know one thing. God is still on the throne. My loved ones are with him. They're comforted. They're no longer hurting. They're no longer struggling. They're with him. And bless your heart, one day I'm going to get to be with them and with him forever. And even though they may be buried, they are not dead. They're alive, man. They're alive. For un reasons unknown to us, things happen. God don't owe us an explanation. But he does say, even though they're buried doesn't mean that they're dead. Amen. You know, I'm looking for Jesus to come. I really am. I think it's going to be sooner than later. Bless your heart. My daughter works over it. I'm just going to call the name of it. I don't even care. I don't want to get her in trouble. But a legacy bank over there, and they're forcing all their employees to get the shot or else she'll be terminated. And not only are they forcing them to get this shot or else they're terminated, they're forcing them to wear some kind of an indicator that they have been vaccinated. So now she'll have to wear some kind of something, I don't know, whatever, some kind of ribbon or maybe a colored card or something of that nature so that when they see that, they will know that she has received the vaccination. Friend, if that's not a prelude to the mark of the beast, I don't know what is. I'm not saying the vaccination is the mark of the beast. If you hear that, you didn't hear that from me. But I can see readily now how people will just reach out and receive it. They'll be forced to receive it. If they're going to buy or sell or trade or get gain, they're going to be forced. Can you not see this unfolding right before our very eyes? So I'm looking for Jesus to come. But just in case he don't and I have to die, let me read you a verse. Jesus who died for us, that whether we wake, that's me right now, or whether I sleep, that means I have to die. One of these days, we're going to live together with him. So even though I may have to get buried, and don't I look good enough to get buried right now? Ain't that what that lady said? Rafe, you look good enough to get buried. I may get buried.
right now. But bless your heart. Throw the dirt on me if you want to, because even though I'm buried, it don't mean that I'm dead. <laughs> I'll be more alive then than I've ever been before. Remember this, and I'm done. Remember this little formula. Watch this. Return of Jesus plus resurrection plus rapture equals a reunion. Even though we're buried, don't mean that we're dead. I've enjoyed preaching through the life of Elijah. I really have. I have no idea where we're going now, but we'll go somewhere, bless your heart. But I'm sure glad for that last story about his life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the encouragement. The, the